Welcome to the Everyone's a Critic Movie Review Podcast, episode 585. My co-host Bob Zerl, with me as always, is professional film critic Sean Patrick and Jeff Lasseter. Uh, visit us on some of the social media platforms. They used to say all of them, but really it's just <laughs> Instagram, Facebook, and whatever Twitter is now. Our handle is Critics Pod. All the links are in our show notes. Uh, we're on YouTube, Patreon, T Public. Our patreon.com slash, t- slash critics pod is the best way to help support the podcast. We do have a T Public link over at ihatecritics.net. Uh, Sean, where can people get your reviews? Uh, geeks.media, horror.media, and uh, Sean at the movies.blogspot.com, where I'm uh, post. I've got all my uh, archives of the past 22 years. And Jeff, where can people get your art? My website is jefflasseter.com. That's got links to my Etsy where you can buy directly from me. Uh, it's also got links to my Tee Public and anything else I'm setting up. Um, I'm also going to try to put in uh, where I'm going to be appearing as far as conventions and things. Because I've got a couple. Uh, I know there's a QC Toy Show and a couple cons that are in the Quad Cities that I'll be in, as well as some in Chicago and maybe Indiana and other parts of Iowa all fall. Excellent. Uh, all the links to Jeff's art and Sean's movies are also in our show notes as well. Uh, we'll start the show talking about Pee Wee Herman. Earlier today, he passed away. Uh, and what do you were you guys fans of Paul Rubens? I was. Uh, you know, growing up, I I, I watched uh, Pee Wee's Playhouse, and uh, I was uh, I obviously I watched uh, uh, Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Uh, you know, religiously, uh, I, I was a big fan. I, I was into it. I, I have uh, I have really fond memories of seeing uh, Pee Wee's Playhouse specifically on on Saturday mornings, and uh, really you know falling in love with that character. And then Pee Wee's Big Adventure is such a perfect uh, distillation of that character and who that character was. And you know I, what I love watching about it today is it's it's evolved and changed for me so much because as a kid you don't get everything that he's doing and as an adult you do and it becomes a little bit richer and a little bit more exciting um it could be cloying it could be kind of over the top and and at times but uh, i i really do have a lot of fond memories uh, of of that and i was always kind of fascinated by him uh throughout his entire career he he uh he was very funny in an episode of 30 rock where his most of his body didn't work <laughs> <laughs> he was like tremendous. He just shows off this tremendous uh, physical talent doing that. Um, I never expected to see him in the Buffy the Vampire Slayer movie doing what he did there. It was very surprising. He pops up, I believe, is it Blues Brothers that he's in? I think he's in Blues Brothers where he plays like a waiter or something. Uh, which you just, you, again, you just never know where you're going to see him. But I love his origin story. He narrowly missed ending up on... SNL in 1980, that disaster season after they fired everybody and brought in an entirely new cast. Uh, he auditioned for that, didn't get it, uh, went out to L.A., started Pee Wee's Playhouse and was on HBO with a Pee Wee's Playhouse special within a year. Uh, and you, know, you can imagine just how the world, his world, uh, the comedy world changes if he ends up you know, bombing on that disastrous season of SNL and... Uh, <laughs> And doesn't do Pee Wee's Playhouse. It's 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 a fascinating. There's an alternate universe where all this never happened. Um, but you read everything about him today, and all the pe- things people were saying about him, it, it was easy to get choked up and emotional about it because, I mean, just everybody who talked about him loved him. And I know that's kind of typical of the way we look at celebrities after they die. But and these were these were the pros of comedy talking about. It. These are the 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 true icons of comedy. The people that we all look up to. We're talking about Pee Wee Herman and what they, what he meant to them, uh, Paul Rubens, what he meant to them, and yeah, I, I just I think the guy was awesome. I didn't get to watch him a lot as a kid because my mom always thought it was weird, so we never we didn't have HBO number one, but two we just never. I don't know. She was just like, "I'll turn that off." He's he's too weird, and then he got <laughs> caught doing what he did. So she's like, "See, I knew it." Uh, but I saw the movies. Uh, the, Pee Wee's Big Adventure and the Big Top, whatever it was, 
and that's kind of it. I mean, I was a, I never really I never saw Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I've never seen that movie. Uh, I haven't really ever watched Blues Brothers, <laughs> so uh, I really have very limited uh, experience with Pee Wee or Paul Rubens. Uh, what about you, Jeff? I I appreciate him much more now than I did when you know he kind of blew up, and I was never a fan of Pee Wee's Big Adventure. It just it was just not my thing at the time. Um, and Big Top Pee Wee, same thing. It just that character really never resonated with me. But him and Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the movie, that whole protracted after the credits death scene where he's still going, ah, 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 you know, it just, I mean, that to me was the best part of that movie. Um, and I, I like the movie, but the TV series is way better. But his part in that, you know, as one of Rutger Hauer's minions and just the two of them and the, the play that they did um, was just great. Um, as an adult and somebody who got into like the downtown scene, uh, you know, and reading about him as this really kind of subversive comic, uh, it really, that's when I got, I had an appreciation for him. Um, I, you know, just I kind of didn't realize that it, it was a character until after he got caught jacking it in a theater, which is a lot of people are talking, you know, still talking about today. And uh, he did have the best comeback ever yes. when he opened up for the I think it was was it the VMAs or was it the American Music Awards? It was an MTV award show. It was the VMAs. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> originally I. Bruce Valanche shared a story today where originally they were going to be uh, the joke was going to say um, if uh, if you fart in front of a bunch of people, you're always going to be known as stinky. But MTV said, no, well, we're basic cable, so we have to bleep the word fart. So they yeah. came up with heard any good jokes lately because there were so many Pee Wee Herman jokes going around that. Uh, and I think that, you know, it's just that was the. That was the best joke you could have come up with at the time, uh, and you know, and and as he went on, uh, he played the the father of Oswald Cobblepot, the Penguin in Batman Returns, um, you know, which he and his wife was played by somebody from Pee Wee's Play- Playhouse, who is the name is absolutely escaping me right now, but you know, they played together on both of those, and it just seeing that as, a, as an adult and realizing all the people that, you know, all the little parts that he played throughout his career, he was way more than just Pee Wee Herman. Mm-hmm. So absolutely. Um, and with, without him, we may miss. not, we may not have those Batman movies. We may not have Tim Burton being who he is. I mean, Tim mm-hmm. Burton got a start uh, with Pee Wee. Yeah. So, you know, he, he'll be, he'll definitely be missed. Yeah, he's definitely underappreciated. It's doing a character for comedy is not easy. You know, there's so many that no. are the butt of jokes or not taken seriously. So it it really is a challenge and he pulled it off for as long as he could and really brought it back recent like, you know, in the last ten years yeah. or so. Yeah. I mean, that that was a forty year character that held up, you know. It wasn't just like you know, like it like Sean said, if he played on Saturday Night Live, he could still be doing, you know, the the paper, the copier guy, like what's his face does. Um, <laughs> yeah. Right. Probably would have gone the way of Ed Grimley. <laughs> well, Martin Short though had a great career, yeah. but the, char- the character of yeah. Ed Grimley yeah. was a short-lived thing. It didn't. It's it's still remembered, but Pee Wee went on to be like far bigger than that. Right. Right. So. Yeah, definitely uh it's a loss. Anything else on Paul Rubens before we move on? Okay, then. Not for me. Uh we'll start with The Haunted Mansion. Haunted Mansion is uh I, I don't know if it's is it a horror comedy, is it a family horror comedy? What the hell is this movie intended to be? <laughs> um the film stars Lakeith Stanfield. 
Uh, it's directed by um, the guy who did Dear White People. He's a really talented guy, and I think he had something interesting that he wanted to do here, but he's trying to serve far too many people, uh, far too many ideas. He wants to talk about grief and the way that grief you know, can kind of hold people back and have negative effects if you don't deal with it properly, which is a good topic. Um, but he's also trying to make a family-friendly blockbuster while doing it, and those two things are just kind of opposed to each other because it's hard to have fun with a main character who's just kind of downbeat the entire time and possibly considering ending his life so he can be with his dead wife. I mean... <laughs> Uh, so you've got these the, these disparate elements trying to work together and consistently failing to work together to provide zero laughs and really zero memorable moments. I mean, honestly, other than I say the last few minutes when Lakeith Stanfield delivers this really powerful, you know, cathartic moment, this movie is really DOA. I mean, I just didn't find anything particularly interesting about this. I was writing my review today and I'm doing the kind of the character introductions to set up who everybody is. And I realized I was about four paragraphs in before I even mentioned that there's a ghost in the movie because <laughs> <laughs> the ghosts are that unmemorable. Uh, I guess the best one would be Jamie Lee Curtis as a, as a, a woman who's trapped in a crystal ball and she's like a psychic and uh, whatnot. She's the most, you know, interesting, I guess, ghost character. And, you know, cause it's probably because it's Jamie Lee Curtis, <laughs> not necessarily because of the character. Uh, yeah. Jared Leto is completely useless uh, in the role of the hat man or the hat box man, whatever the hell he is. I don't care. Didn't, didn't make it. He, the sketch of him in the trailer is scarier than anything he does in the movie. <laughs> this movie, I don't think it's bad. It's just wildly mediocre. I mean, it's just wildly mediocre. There's just so many different things happening. None of them is landing. I, I really just don't get why Danny DeVito and Owen Wilson are even here. Uh, Tiffany Haddish is just her act has become truly stale, and it's just the same character she plays every single time out. Uh, she brings no nuance or nothing new or interesting to this. And I don't hate this. I sound like I hate it. I just didn't care. Mostly, I just was really bored and just kind of was done with it about halfway through. And then Lakeith Stanfield delivered, you know, a few things here and there that were you know, full of heart and talent. And, I, you know, that's just a shame that that's not the movie that this is. Was it better or worse than the Eddie Murphy Haunted Mansion? Better, but that's a low bar. <laughs> that, <laughs> I know that's <laughs> Haunted Mansion 2003 is a real piece of crap. Eddie Murphy does not care. He's totally not giving a fuck mode. And Terrence Stamp is basically shitting on the movie the entire time. Just, just, you could almost see him roll his eye. Times. That is a shame, though, because the trailers looked... I thought it looked pretty good. Uh, that said, neither my wife nor kid were that interested in going, so I ended up not making the trip. Uh and decided to see it later on at Disney Plus or whatever if we ever do watch it. Uh, but that is kind of a bummer because I, I did think it looked good. Well, it's a good cast. I mean, Danny DeVito, Owen Wilson, Tiffany Haddish, Rosario Dawson, Lakeith Stanfield. I mean, tremendous cast. They just I just don't understand what he wanted to do with this. All these scenes just seem to start and then stall. Uh, and And <laughs> like I said, they just... There is zero interesting ghosts in this movie. Just zero. I couldn't even tell you, honestly. I watched the movie. I wrote about the movie. I'm not even sure what it was that Jared Leto's hat box man ghost was trying to accomplish. I honestly couldn't tell you what it was. I know he's trying to get like his 1,000th soul, and that means something. But what that means, I have no idea. I mean, I don't know what Jared Leto's trying to do, period, in life. So that could... <laughs> Play a role too. Uh, yeah, I don't really have a whole lot of questions to keep this segment going. Anything else on the hot? You, you didn't see it either, right, Jeff? No, I'm fun employed right now, so I can see one movie a week generally, and this was not it. <laughs> we did all, however, see Talk to Me, I'm assuming. 
Yes, uh, talk yes. a tremendous new horror film from A24, the best in the business. Uh, the, this is a, a, a movie out of Australia about a group of uh, teenagers who come up with this game surrounding this ceramic hand that is said to be the encased hand of a dead person. And if you hold the hand and you say, talk to me, you can see the dead. And if you hold it for longer than 90 seconds, you could invite the dead into your body, which is a premise that kind of feels familiar, but the way it's presented is feels new and fresh because these characters feel new and fresh and young and different. And the, the set pieces that they choose to, to, uh, to explore here are very interesting. The family dynamics, the, uh, again, this is another movie that is examining grief. Uh, the main character, Mia, has lost her mother, and she's very, you know, very, very invested in that. And then when she starts to hear the voices of the dead, specifically what she thinks might be her mother, that becomes a, a, a driving force in the movie as well. Uh, but there's this young teenage character who really, he's the, he's the outcast, he's the little brother of one of the girls, and he really just wants to be part of it. And then when he becomes part of it, it becomes horrific and terrifying and awful and extraordinary on top of it because this movie is genuinely scary it's got a brilliantly uh crafted atmosphere but i love the choices the choices that they make in terms of what how they present horror and how they present you know real serious violence uh, are are really smart and economical and and incredibly well paced I, i adore this movie yeah, I absolutely love this movie too. Uh, just the way they, where a lesser movie in the third act wouldn't know where to go with this, and the filmmakers aren't afraid of you know any corners they could back themselves into, and they just they weave through it perfectly between two different realities, and the actual terror that it brings to this movie is pretty. It, it just. It's fresh. It's something nice. It's, there's nothing formulaic about it. Uh, you, you know, you mentioned the idea of they almost made summoning the de- devil or whatever, uh, the demons or the ghosts, a drinking game, more or less. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, whether you would do it or not, you know people that would probably do it. <laughs> you know, the, at least they make you believe that you know somebody that would actually participate in something like this. So the whole thing was, I bought in from the beginning. I, I loved where it went. It kept me on my toes, and it just it was so smart to keep it from being just your run of the mill horror film. And you know, do what A twenty four does, Jeff. Ah, <laughs> uh, I love this movie. Um, I what I liked about it is they didn't. The explanation of the game was. You know, they were. This was something that was just known in the in the universe of this movie, and they didn't, you know, have to set it all up with, you know, fourteen different tales at the beginning, and it was going to be so spooky. They just went to this party and they were just doing it, and I like that because I don't. I think with this, you didn't need a huge backstory, and I feel like if it was a Bloomhouse movie, there would have been, mm-hmm. you know, two prequels and a sequel and stuff already. Um, I like the conceit that nobody knew what this hand was and that was it, was it actually the hand or was it just the power of suggestion? Mm-hmm. Because a couple times I was like, I think she's just, she wants so badly to see her mother again that half of this is just in her head. Um, I thought that the, the performances were all just supernatural. Um, and Miranda Otto, she just, she was just like, she was such a mom, (laughs) you know, she just, she, she knew that this girl was grieving and needed a family and, you know, didn't have much at home. So she kind of took her in and like family, when something bad happens, you get the blame first, (laughs) you know? Um, I thought that, you know, all, all the, the, quote unquote teens who are all like 20, 21 um, were really natural, uh, naturalistic acting and uh, directed like it was directed low budget, you know, but not in a bad way. And I know that it wasn't, it didn't have a low budget. It had a decent budget to it. Um, But 
just the way that everything was framed and the third act just clipped along like crazy, just like doom, 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 doom. And then it's over and you're like, whoa, what the fuck? It was so smart though. I love the, I mean, again, that's like three perfect movies in a row for me that I've got to see. <laughs> uh, there was not an ounce of fat on this thing. Uh, everything was well thought out. Uh, it was just, it was fun, but it was like truly scary, which you don't get that a lot. I mean, there's scenes there at the end where you're like, when you're done trying to figure it out and you're just kind of going with it. Cause now you kind of know mm-hmm. what point of view you're in and it is just, you wonder what's going to happen and it's not afraid to go anywhere it, there. It's a movie where anything can happen. And I mean, even right out of the gate, there's kind of a shocking, uh, scene and we've seen scenes like that in other like Bloomhouse movies and whatnot but later on in the movie you see how he could do what he did to himself in that opening scene uh based on how she's reacting with her dad it's just i don't know it was just really really well done and i think everybody needs to see this and again it's a good movie to see in the theater definitely yeah Sophie the- Wilde the, the the star here is phenomenal I mean, just a wonderful face. Her her reaction to this stuff, the the way she takes it all in, the the horror she shows, uh, it's just so much depth in just the look on her face. It's brilliant. And then, you know, just the just a perfectly measured performance from a from an actress I'd not been familiar with before. She's really the heart of this thing. Those eyes, those amazing eyes, communicating just so much. And the same can be said of uh, Joe Bird, who plays the the teenage boy. I mean, when he starts smashing his face against things, my God, it's just it is terrifying. And the the way that scene is shot is absolutely perfect. You could not frame it better uh, from the way that they did it, pu- pulling us away from him, putting us in close, pulling us away. I mean, just absolutely remarkably remarkable piece of work. Well, yeah, and even before we get there, so many people going through this little game. Uh, allows you to, I mean, the trailer shows different things happening, so you're expecting it to happen faster, but it takes its time, and then you kind of start to relax with everybody going through what they're going through and enjoying the joke of it, and then it just, it takes its time, you know, really making it scary, because at some points it's pretty funny, uh, some of the stuff that the, the teens go through, uh, I, I don't know. I just I love the pacing of it. the The way they play with us as a viewer, uh, it's just really well done. Yeah, I, I, the the only thing for me that took me out of it a little bit was the fact that the older sister looked so much like Isabel Furman from the Orphan that I was kept saying, "Is that her? <laughs> Is that her? Is that Isabel Furman?" But. <laughs> <laughs> she was uh, had nothing to do with the movie. Uh, she was great, and her relationship with Miranda Otto was really a, a wonderful uh, mother daughter rep, rep uh, relationship. Even as we don't see very much of it, that what we do see of it is impactful. It means something. It matters uh, to to this story. I uh, just so many cool things about this movie. I, I was comparing it uh, in in another conversation I was having with uh, to to bodies, 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 which wants to be a movie like this it wants to be it doesn't feel nearly as natural for some reason this movie feels natural this feels like an outgrowth of an actual you know group of teenagers hanging out whereas that film feel, felt forced and slapped together and especially with the whole Peter, Pete Davidson stuff just felt unnatural from the very beginning and never gets natural yeah. this movie feels every inch of a as real as it as its universe can make it and that, that just is so compelling yeah, with bodies. Well, everybody's bodies, just so natural, ahead. right? No, I just say everybody's just so natural in this, and in there, everybody's a personality, and you throw Pete Davidson into it, and it takes you out. I I got really bored by that movie really fast. Well, I felt like with that movie again, I didn't mind it because it was something a little bit fresher than a lot of the IPs that we keep getting back. But you're right, you have you bring in somebody who's known, which takes you out of the movie. It's a distraction. Two, I think they were so happy with themselves with that ending that they mm-hmm. couldn't wait to get there and uh it was rushed and forced and it just wasn't 
I don't know. It, it could have been better if they took their time and really thought through this one. It almost felt like as they were writing it, they didn't know where they're going to go with it. And they just let it go the way it should. And I don't know. It, it just was so, like you said, natural. Everybody fit. No, at no point you're going, oh, I would, would never do that or don't do that. You idiot or whatever. Even if you're yeah. thinking that you buy into the, that character doing it. So uh, I, it's it's so smart in that way, and that ending is powerhouse. Those final those final couple scenes, and we won't spoil them here, but uh, the those final couple scenes are play out so brilliantly and and, and so <laughs> uh, cathartic, really, in the end. Uh, that the, the where we arrive is so. Oof. And uh, the the directors have been talking about how they had this just really thick book of lore that they put into this. Like you can tell, they put a lot of thought into this like where did this hand come from it's not even in the movie but it's like it's something that they thought about to make sure that this made sense within the universe in their minds they built to telling this story and they've still got other stories that they can tell with this which they're considering right now and i'm eager to see what they might uh, come up with sadly uh no sadly i mean i'm i'm maybe i'm underestimating their talent i don't know i just don't like the fact that they're attached to a street fighter movie I think they, I think that that's beneath their talent, but you know we'll have to wait and see. I said the same thing. I guess I didn't exactly say the same thing about Barbie, but I did worry that Barbie wasn't something that I thought Greta Gerwig should be working on. So maybe I'm wrong. Well, I mean, hopefully we, I'm wrong. We did the same with Denis Villeneuve, and granted, he made great movies with Blade Runner, or whatever, and Dune. And I'm sure Dune Two is going to be great, but I'd still rather see Enemy again or you know, arrival or something original, <laughs> but, uh, you know, they could make a great street fighter movie, I guess. I'm sure that'll be better. I just like the be. fact that I just like the fact that people like gen X and gen, you know, to gen Z are able to make movies about stuff that interests them. Um, you know, and they get the chance because they make these like just perfect horror movies, you know, or perfect sci-fi, you know, they just get this, we get it, I guess, as a generation. And, <laughs> yep. you know, um, I've, I've seen tweets or skeets and threads and everything this week about his horror back. Horror has never left. And, I mean, I want to see a Greta Gerwig horror movie now. You know, a, a good, honest to goodness horror movie directed by Greta Gerwig. Yeah. Uh, how did this do? Because I, I mean, granted, I saw it at like nine in the morning, but it was an empty theater. It was an empty theater, was it? No. Uh, again, nine in the morning. So let's that does play a role. I don't think a lot of people go to horror movies that early. Yeah, I don't think it did particularly well. I know, uh, I know, Haunted Mansion came in lower than they wanted, wanted which is our. It did, okay, it did really well actually. I was, uh, I'm off here. It, it made ten million. Oh, uh, wow. It came in six at the box office but it made 10 million and only cost i think four and a half million to make so yeah they're they're in the money on that one that's huge for a movie like this because i can see my daughters and our friends talking about you know this movie like the same way they do you know hereditary is one of those movies they talk about and they're all afraid to watch uh, i could see this one being one of those horror movies you just gotta see it's so scary if, especially if tiktok does something with it uh, i don't know it's it really is terrifying at times. I um, I saw it on Thursday night uh, at the five fifteen showing, and I had there was a pretty good crowd. And it was it was weird because the week before when I went to see Barbie, there were a lot of guy couples, and I don't know if they were like romantic couples or just two guys hanging out and watching a movie. But this one was like couples of women. You know, of all kind of all ages. And I, I, I like going to theater and not having anybody on either side of me. So I saw, you know, I I opened up to see where the seat who like if I had a seat on either side of me. And no, I didn't. And I was like, oh, crap. And then as I went to the bathroom, these two girls were coming in and, you know, like probably late teens. And I was like, oh, please don't let them sit next to me because they'll be on their phone the whole time. They weren't. They were so wrapped in, up in the movie that they were just like jumping and uh you know there's that that moment and it's not really spoiling anything but you hear the cry where she's like ah! and it legit the way it was projected 
sounded like somebody was actually doing it in the theater. And yes. I looked over at them and, and yeah. <laughs> and they were looking, they, they were looking over and I was like, that's on screen. Right. And the one girl goes, I hope so. <laughs> Cause it kind of comes from behind you. It came from behind you. Yeah. Like great sound yeah. design. Yeah. And I'm like mm-hmm. being in an empty theater really <laughs> messed with me with that scene. <laughs> Cause that was really well done. I forgot about that. Yeah. And, and the manifestation of, well, one of the manifestations of this, I guess, demon or whatever, the old man or woman, I couldn't tell with no teeth and, you know, bubbling skin and stuff. I was just like, holy shit, it looks like Freddy Krueger. And now it looks like, you know, an old woman. And now it looks like an old man. And it was just so well done and so just disgusting and terrifying <laughs> yeah that when she goes into uh, uh essentially this other place to see where she can find the the boy's body or the boy's soul mm-hmm. and try and get him back to his body it reminded me it was a few years ago we watched it bob there was this horror movie that was just this huge mass of bodies billy warlock was in it i yes. that movie society I, society yeah that movie sucks <laughs> this movie, like, <laughs> but this movie takes just the I, that visual that they were trying to do in that movie and does it and does it so well and actually finds like the actual way to do that in a in a horror movie that was cool <laughs> i loved that it's the shunting jerry <laughs> <laughs> but no that scene was so crucial though because that played with your head the rest of the movie because mm-hmm. now you're wondering what what's real and what's not and uh even with the way it ends you really don't know <laughs> you yep. know Yep. Uh, so I, I don't. This just e- even the good Bloomhouse movies. I, I, this definitely is above those, in my opinion. I, oh wait, uh, yeah. No, this is an A twenty four movie. So <laughs> yeah, but it's still. I, I mean, I'm not going to put it on Hereditary's level, but it's like that's also high praise. That's really a high bar to hit. It, but I love it. It's a tier below that. Yeah, but it is still like a, yeah. it. It's worthy of being an A twenty four movie. Hundred percent. The worst part of this movie, though, was the Exorcist trailer from David Gordon Green before. <laughs> yep. What the fuck? I didn't see that. Oh, I saw. You're it. lucky. I saw it in front of Oppenheimer the week before. Uh, yeah. It, uh, what's her name is back, and Ellen Burstyn. Ellen Burstyn. Yeah, it's. Mm-hmm. What's funny is she said, you know, everybody's like, "Oh, Ellen Burstyn's back," and it's David Gordon Green. He's going to do what he did for Jamie Lee Curtis. I'm like, you, what, what, she, what he did to Jamie Lee Curtis <laughs> because yeah. Um, and she said, somebody asked her about it in an interview a few months ago. She said, I did it because I wanted a donation to my charity and it's a glorified cameo. And, and I'm like, Oh, okay. Uh, but I mean, Isn't that basically what she did for Wicker Man too? <laughs> well, <laughs> but her, but I, I came up with uh, Go ahead. I was going to say her character doesn't even, I mean, it's not, if you're going to bring back a character, it would be not her for a yeah. re- remake or a sequel, but whatever. My idea for the Exorcist like legacy sequel is the girls aren't possessed, but are actually lesbians, like tween lesbians. And the parents are super religious, so they obviously think that they must be possessed by demons. So they send them to conversion camp or whatever, and they call Chris McNeil to say, our daughters are possessed. You wrote this book about our, about your daughter being possessed. What do we do? And she comes, and she has to get Reagan, who is also a lesbian, because I just want everybody to be a lesbian in this movie. Um, she has to get Reagan to come back and try to convince them, but it turns out that the reason that the parents are being so horrible towards the kids as one of the parents is possessed and recognizes Chris and Reagan. That would be a better movie than this trailer looks like it's going to be weird choice. Like to, they have Linda Blair. She's a mm-hmm. technical consultant on this movie. She's not in it. <laughs> what the, well, why the I have a feeling in the movie. I have a feeling because they've already finished the second one. I have a feeling she's in the Chris will probably die in this one. It'll be Reagan in the next one. Hmm. Um, I oh, can't David I love, can just find something else to ruin. Right? Just stick with comedy and whatever they're doing. It's something, yeah. something new, <laughs> make a new thing and ruin that. Well, I, mean, I it was already ruined. <laughs> <laughs> 
I just I want this also Blue means House. that Exorcist Three is not canon anymore, Bob. <laughs> I don't care. I like it for what it is. <laughs> Exorcist Three is great, <laughs> and it could still be canon. I mean, no, it's uh, they, they're going directly from the original, according to oh, you, you got know what? The second one. <laughs> Fuck that. Fuck David Gordon Green. So. <laughs> well, I missed that. I, I knew it was happening. I've not seen the trailer, though. Go I mean, watch the trailer. It's literally just there. They do play off the original Exorcist trailer a little bit. And there's a couple images because of that that I liked. But I was like, it's just not. It's just not. So uh, they need to get Russell Crowe come in and <laughs> create you know so he can create his cinematic universe that is funny during, that's that was great then that. get richard Armitage in his priest cop from uh <laughs> from that movie he just did the pope something or other and <laughs> <laughs> then you get out create that pope cinema because then get franco nero to play the pope because again like you could have yep. this whole universe it'd be great no, during Oppenheimer when the trailer came on, one, my son's petrified of horror movies. Uh <laughs> yet he loves the band Ice Nine Kills and he knows how to play all the themes on the piano. Uh however, with The Exorcist, he just he watched it and he was like, We already got the Pope's Exorcist. Do we really need this? <laughs> he said that out loud in the theater. I'm like, you're not watching that one either. <laughs> but no, I it's I don't know. I want David Gordon Green to be good, and I like the Righteous Gemstones, and I don't know how much he's involved with that. I know he's directed a few episodes, but I'd rather they do stuff like that and quit trying to resurrect and save these franchises they've ran into the ground. Yeah, he's really coming off like a studio hack to me. Mm -hmm. But not to enough people. That's what's bugging me, because people like those Halloween movies, and I don't get it. What did they see? <laughs> I mean, we already had Lori as a an alcoholic like basket case in H two O, and then you know we didn't have to have that again. She should have been the Lori from Part Three, and then and this whole you know like Part Three as shitty as it was, it was shitty because it was the quote unquote end of a trilogy. That didn't make any sense. But if that had been the beginning of the trilogy, I would have loved it. Right. You just got to get rid of Anthony Michael Hall as the Tommy Doyle because he was terrible. Evil dies tonight. Evil dies tonight. No, it doesn't. Shut up. <laughs> or at least don't Sorry. play around. With I mean, he's clearly supernatural in his movies. Ex- yeah. Establish that out of the gate. So there's no... Yeah. But I don't know. Anyway, fuck Halloween. Well, the fact that they took the fact that they took away the one thing that made it made sense that he would be following her, that they were brother and sister, that made sense if you're gonna make more than one movie. But they took that away and set it up so that some doctor who never met Lori is trying to get them it's just it was so forced and dumb. But even if it made sense, it's pretty weak because he's crazy yeah. and he, he's not going to know who his sister is. <laughs> it was doomed from the start. It was just doomed from the start. It was just a group of people taking advantage of a well-known uh, intellectual property and that's all that anyone making it cared about. Mm-hmm. All right. Our classic is 1981's The Hand. The Hand, written and directed by Oliver Stone and starring Michael Caine, is a cartoonist who loses his hand in a car accident and starts to go insane. Or is it his hand that's going insane? It's hard to say. We don't really know. Uh, It's hard to care. (laughs) It's hard to care. Uh, (laughs) I, I like Michael Caine as an actor. I think he's a brilliant actor. I think he was amazing in The Dark Knight. But when he is bad, he's really, really bad. Like in Jaws, when he's just completely checked out and just bored as fuck. Uh, he, he, he seems to be enjoying his vacation in Jaws 4, but <laughs> beyond that, you know. Uh, and here he's just, he seems to enjoy some aspects of what he's doing. And other times he's just, 
he just looks like he's drunk. <laughs> just, I know he's playing a guy who's drunk a lot, but it seems like the actor is actually drunk as opposed to just the character. Um, I, I want to check those bottles. I think they were actually full well, when he got them. Being that it was Oliver Stone, it's a high probability they were all drunk. <laughs> True. That, that Oliver Stone's cameo was not an act. He was just the bum. Um, <laughs> That's how well, you know that this. Every day. You know that this was one of Michael Caine's paycheck movies. Oh yeah, he, he, he talked about putting a new garage at his house. Yeah, yeah. That's like Jaws and uh, Blame It on Rio and this. They were all just they were. He just needed a paycheck, like Betsy Palmer and Friday the Thirteenth. Just needed a new car or whatever, so he he did this movie, um, <laughs> and it shows. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this movie is in, incredibly odd because there's at times where it's trying to be like a super serious horror movie, and then you have to watch people being attacked by a fake hand and trying and trying to sell the idea that this hand is is murdering them, and it becomes very funny, like a nineteen you know, like a nineteen fifties drive-in movie. Uh, which is this a remake? Because there was a movie in nineteen sixty called The Hand, also, but I didn't. I, I almost ended up. No, watching I don't. That. I don't think so. I went to watch this version, this this movie, The Hand, and the service that I was watching it on like, served me up the 1960 version. And <laughs> I don't know if they're the same or not, but I didn't watch that one. But I do, yeah. You know, like this, this is a concept that's been that's been done uh, a few times, even back in the drive-in days. Um, <laughs> but it was done in a way that understands that the idea of a hand attacking somebody is innately funny like you know evil dead 2 it's innately funny to watch a man fight his own hand <laughs> and here they oliver stone doesn't understand that this is funny <laughs> he doesn't have a sense of humor he's never had a sense of humor his entire life so of course he doesn't see this as being funny but it is absolutely hysterical it is a funny visual yeah, yeah it Go ahead. I got nothing good to say. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's if you played it kind of, you know, tongue in cheek, absolutely works a hundred percent. Playing it straight either works or fails, and it just fails. Although the cast is great. I mean, you got Michael Michael Caine, um, Andrea Marcovici, who was always just a punchline and a Sandra Bernhard uh, thing for me. Um, you know, she's, she's much more natural than I expect her to be. Uh, the reason I picked this movie was because I thought I owned it. <laughs> You're the uh, 1960 and, version, don't you? <laughs> no, 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 no. I, ha I, at one point I had a four, like a, the four compilation disc movies. I had this, Eyes of a Stranger, Deadly Friend, and Someone is Watching Me. I have no idea what happened to it. I went to watch it last night. It wasn't there. Uh, so I was like, <laughs> well, shit. And then I watched it, and I was like, oh, you know what? I don't think I ever finished this movie. I think I may have just started it. And then I was like, no. I actually – somebody stole the DVD, and I was thinking of The Car, which we'll never, ever watch. <laughs> so – all of these, you know, like inanimate objects coming to life movies that came out around the same time. Mm. So. I still want to see that killer tire movie. Rubber, was it called? Oh, go oh. ahead. Feel free. I'm not going to. No, is it that good? I, Sean, I have no, absolutely 100% no desire to watch that movie, even as an ironic, funny thing. I just, as somebody. Explain it to me, fine, but no desire whatsoever. <laughs> but that's Bob, do you, have, show. Do you have no thoughts on this? My all, thoughts or? are, I kept, the first time I got up to go to the restroom or get something to eat, I paused it. But the third or fourth time, I just kind of let it keep running. <laughs> so then I'd go back. <laughs> I just, I was bored more than anything. I didn't find it entertaining. Uh, it just, it was, it turned into just a hassle to get through it. So then I pulled up Wikipedia to find out what the plot was just so I could get, I mean, I finished it. I sat there and 
but it was like reading a book and not comprehending what you're reading. It was just mm-hmm. shit was happening and I wasn't entertained and it was just kind of like, is this over yet? Uh, I don't know. I just, I want I wanted to like Oliver Stone. I always thought I did until we started doing this podcast and really <laughs> only platoon is good. <laughs> and even that you guys are trying to convince me it's not as good as everybody thinks it is. It's still a good movie. But that's the only thing he's ever done that's remotely decent that I can think of. <laughs> yeah, he, he pretty much sucks. Uh, <laughs> this is pretty much a garbage director uh, <laughs> in person. Um, <laughs> I, this is the thing that just like kept going through my mind is like I kept staring at Michael Caine's hair. It seems to change yeah. between every scene <laughs> and in just the weirdest in the weirdest way until he's finally like he's got this like <laughs> white guy he, he afro does. thing going on at the end because <laughs> he, cause he's crazy. So he's got crazy hair. Well, he literally <laughs> goes from Michael Caine as Alfred to Gene Wilder in Young Frankenstein <laughs> by the end of the movie. I looked at it and I kept like, what is his hair? What is that hair? Yeah. And I was like, oh shit, it's Gene Wilder and young Frankenstein. <laughs> it was so distracting. It just, like I said, every scene, it's somehow just a little bit weirder and different. Uh, and, and, and no one comments on it. It's not part of the plot. It's just a weird little inconsistency because nobody gave a damn. <laughs> well, and I mean, the last two weeks, I saw Barbie, I saw Oppenheimer, I saw Dr. Strangelove. I then watched Jaws just for fun, then talked to me. So it was a nice run, or not talked to me. Yeah, talked to me. Nice <laughs> run of movies, nice run of perfection movies. And then I just did not want to be here the entire time. And it, Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> no, no, no. I'll, I, I have my share, Scotland PAs, that are... <laughs> I'm not blaming anybody, uh just bored hopefully next week that changes with jaws 2 <laughs> is jaws i just two i want to go on record that you guys like tourist trap and sleepaway camps enough I, yes i will go with that one although sean enough. didn't like sleep like camp one well sean doesn't like anything that's true <laughs> uh next week we do got meg 2 uh the ninja turtles animated movie Dream and Wild, what comes around in Mobland? What are the odds we actually talk about Mobland next week? I'm not sure. I'm, it, it depends. <laughs> how many, I'm not even sure how many screens they're going to put it on, or how many. I mean, how many show times they're going to give it? Because it's just we, we, since when does John Travolta end up going to the theaters with a the movie? This oh, is he's actually going to the theaters. I thought it was just this, something no, streaming, and you're it's being all, ironic. coming to our local theater. <laughs> Oh well, I'm going to tell you right now. I will be seeing the Meg too, and then we'll we'll we will see how much art I sell on Etsy to see if I go to anything else. <laughs> Popcorn's expensive, yo. <laughs> that is a, that. I've been going with my entire family a lot lately, and it's just not cheap. Yeah, I'll either see Meg two or Ninja Turtles or. Probably just one of them, though. It's my daughter's 16th birthday this weekend. So we'll see. I liked the Meg. I liked the original. I I thought it was fun. I wasn't... I just went to enjoy myself and watch a big shark eat a bunch of people. And so I enjoyed it. I didn't look for any deeper themes in the movie or anything <laughs> like that. So I don't, I don't remember us hating it. I thought we thought it was fun. I can't remember exactly. I, I honestly... I, I'm going to have to read my review to actually remember what I thought of the Meg because I don't remember it at all. <laughs> and I, I do think Ninja Turtles looks kind of good. Uh, we'll see. I like uh, the art. I like the animation uh, in the trailer. It looks really good. And I think the characterizations are, so, are at least from the trailer uh, different than what we've seen of the te- Ninja Turtles before in the movies. So that's interesting. Absolutely. Uh, but Jaws 2 is a classic, and in 1993, The Fugitive came out. I'm assuming that's what you guys are going to do on the 93 pod- podcast. Say what? Uh, the Fugitive for the 93 podcast. Is that the movie you guys are going to watch? Or? Oh, yeah. Yeah. We've got to catch up with uh, So I Married an Axe Murderer, and then, yeah, we'll do The Fugitive with that one. So we'll be doubling up again. 
excellent. I didn't kill my wife. I don't care. That's why I remember <laughs> the fugitive. I watched it. I guess I, somebody was saying on Twitter, there's like this backlash against the fugitive. Like the, it suddenly is not popular anymore. Why? It was fun. I don't know. Mm. I mean, I'll be honest. I never loved it. I watched it one time when it came out and never got where everybody talked about it all the time. You think it's a, it's a retroactive thing with Harrison Ford. Cause he's so miserable. <laughs> I mean, he just, I like his acting, but he's just, he's a miserable old guy when it comes to stuff that he's done in the past. And I just wonder if that's has something to do with why people are kind of like, you know, fuck that movie. I'm sure, hmm. especially with his dismissal of Star Wars, more or less, and everybody liking Star Wars. I can see that. All right. Yeah, I don't know. I just, I mean, I, I, I do think that he, he kind of reevaluated a little bit after Carrie Fisher died. That's why he came back for the Rise of Skywalker. Right. Because that was her scene that he came back for. Mm-hmm. He, he, he did what she was going to do. So. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, he is like what the second biggest dr- box office draw in the history of <laughs> movies. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that is our show. Let's go on to flick chart before we wrap it up. Lord of the Rings, the fellowship of the ring or Friday the 13th part two. I know, the 13th. know Lord of the Rings is, is a great movie or whatever. I don't want to ever watch it again. Friday the 13th part 2 Greed, sorry Josh Well done, that sounds great <laughs> Star Wars Episode 2 Attack of the Clones Jailhouse Rock Star Wars Star Wars. My least favorite Star Wars movie But I would still Actually just watch it the other night As I was going to bed If it were King Creole, I'd be voting for that <laughs> Murder by Death Dead poets. I'm familiar with that one? You're not. That's a um, that's a, a spoof of Agatha Christie movies. Oh, and it's you guys. You should. We should do that someday because it's actually really. We'll do that. We, let's do that the next uh, Hercule Poirot. Let's do that because that it's really funny. I've got it. If anybody wants to watch it, so. All right. Write it down so we don't forget. <laughs> Adopting Terror, Dead Poet Society. Never heard of Adopting Terror. It's like a... Is that a QAnon movie? Cause <laughs> the original. QAnon, QAnon meets orphans. 500 Days of Summer, Dead Poet Society. That's tough. That is tough. Um, Dead Poet Society does not have Zoe de Chanel. <laughs> Good Dead Poet Society as well. Sean said 500 Days of Summer. Uh... Dead Poet Society does not have Zoe Deschanel, so. Yeah, Superman 2, The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. Ugh. Um, I think Benjamin Super- Button is more ambitious, so I'm going with that. Superman 2. I'll go Benjamin Button. I'm going to make you guys regret your uh, asking me to come on the show. <laughs> The Last Black Man in San Francisco, Ghost Rider. Last Black Man in San Francisco. That is a tremendous movie. Really awesome. Yeah. I agree. Should I just say Ghost Rider just to piss Sean off? Why would that piss me off? <laughs> I don't know. Because I have terrible taste in movies. <laughs> it's hard to piss him off. Dreamcatcher, 30 Days of Night. 30 Days of Night. Yeah. Agreed. Mostly because it just doesn't have a shitting scene like Dreamcatch. <laughs> Empire of the Sun, Captain Ouch. Phillips. Uh, Captain Phillips, yeah. Yeah, I'm the captain now. <laughs> Running scared, shopping. I'm not familiar with shopping. I, I feel like I have saw shopping, but I don't remember it. I, I, maybe I remember it just being a premiere magazine all the time. Running scared, good morning, Vietnam. Good morning, Vietnam. Yeah. Agreed. Lionheart, Soylent Green. Soylent Green. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) Takes place this year, you know. (laughs) 
Uh, I mean, if, if the rich could get rid of the food, they would. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, what else are they going to do with the terrible homeless problem they have in all these liberal cities? <laughs> Mimic creep show. Creep show. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't really care for either film. Oh, okay. so oh creep show! Creep show's fun though. Meteor shit. Mm. The money pit. White chicks. Money pit. I hate white chicks. <laughs> I'm gonna pick white chicks in honor of my dad because it was only the second movie I ever saw him laugh so hard he cried at. That and Cheech and Chong up in smoke. I'm gonna go white chicks because I live in a money pit and it's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Film socialism, the thirteenth warrior. No. Little man Tate, the thirteenth warrior. Little man Tate. Little man Tate. <laughs> We're both so enthused. <laughs> speaking of Jody, speaking of Jody Foster, did you know that John Hinckley Jr. is out of prison and he's singing love songs on YouTube? Oh God, what the fuck! <laughs> right. I mean, it, there's just so much shit happening. Like, you know, the we live in the worst simulation, <laughs> the worst timeline. I mean, I'm like, come on, could what else? We have aliens that like are the government knows about aliens and nobody cares because everybody is like just trying to stay alive. <laughs> La femme Nikita, liar, liar. La femme Nikita. La femme Nikita. I would watch Point of No Return, the remake of that movie, before I would watch Liar Liar. Let Me In, The Good Girl. Wow, that is Ooh. hard. That is so tough. Oh, because they're both really, really good. Um, Let Me In. I'm going to say The Good Girl. I'm going to go with The Good Girl. So let's let the right one in. I'd go with that. It's just an unnecessary remake, even though it's good. Hmm. The Reader Hostage. The Reader. Yeah. Hostage is in a bad B movie. But it's not, uh, the Reader is still a B movie. movie. <laughs> Sky High, How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days. Sky High. Yeah, Linda, Linda Carter Supremacy. I love that movie. Hot Tub Time Machine, You've Got Mail. Hot Tub Time Machine. Sorry, Mom. <laughs> I agree. I, I thought Hot Tub Time Machine was better than it should have been. Yeah. Also, John Cusack, stop riding your bike on the sidewalks in Chicago. It's illegal. <laughs> the Irishman, the Hudsucker Proxy. Hudsucker Proxy. Uh huh. I'll go with the Irishman. I like that. The Irishman was a chore to watch. Oh. I watched it twice. I'm pretty sure I slept through an hour of it. And you saw it with like Scorsese sitting next to you. <laughs> Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men, Tell No Tales, Thunderball. Pirates of the Caribbean. I don't care. I don't care about Bond. I don't care about Pirates of the Caribbean. Talk about Pirates of the you Caribbean. Did you hear they found Johnny Depp as a hotel room unresponsive a few days ago? No. What the no. fuck? Well, he's they, he's fine, but the, his band had to cancel a date, and they wouldn't say why. And the report just came out today that they he was passed out, and they were able to. I mean, they ended up playing a show a couple of days later, so he's fine. But hmm. I, I mean, I think you know, like when you hear Johnny Depp found unresponsive, I always feel like unresponsive is drugs and alcohol. Well, that's mm-hmm. what they're saying. But then, like they said, Madonna was found unresponsive, and she doesn't really drink or do anything. So, yeah, Johnny Depp uh, does drink a lot. <laughs> <you're>, <laughs> oh yeah, the but, Rolling Stone profile basically explains what happened. But he's like just a younger Keith Richards. But didn't the Madonna thing end up being drugs or some sort of prescription uh, thing? Um, no, she had an infection. Uh, not like a staph infection, but some other kind of um, bacterial infection. So it was just she didn't go to the hospital because, you know, she didn't think she had to, like Prince. 
Although Prince was dead for a couple of days before they announced it, I think. Master and Commander of the Far Side of the World, Jack Reacher. Man, I, lo- I like both those movies a lot. I'm going to go Master and Commander, but I think Jack Reacher is really good. Master and Commander, because Tom Cruise isn't in it. <laughs> i go Master and Commander as well. Face off her. 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 Yes. Conan the Barbarian, the Red Balloon. I've not seen the Red Balloon. Mm-hmm. Would be funny if it popped up. <laughs> I did not. Conan Braveheart. Conan. Conan. Go on Braveheart. <laughs> I liked Braveheart Braveheart when it came out, but that was before Sugar Tits happened, so <laughs> I've never liked Braveheart. It felt like homework to me. Really? I always thought it was oh, yeah. if there was anything wrong with it, it was too actiony and not real and I don't know. Anyway. There was a chore to sit through. Land of the Lost, The Raid. Felt the same way about Gladiator, too. Uh, the Raid. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Doesn't have, does, doesn't have Will Ferrell in it. Uh, Cahill, U.S. Marshal, or Good Luck Chuck? Never heard of Cahill, U.S. Marshal. I'm just getting rid of both of these if you're okay with that. <laughs> Ooh, Romy and Michelle's High School Reunion or Rear uh, Window? Rear Window. I love Romeo and Michelle, but in a real window. I'm because I, I love both of them and I would probably say equally because Rear Window is so good. And ne- like right. you can watch it a hundred times, but I got to give a little love to Romeo and Michelle because I, they have to give it at least one vote. Right. I'll go Rear Window, but it is a great movie. Romeo and Michelle. Spe- What's called Scarves? What? Oh, <laughs> Species the Shining. Uh, the Shining. Yeah, The Shining. Did you have a Mitch McConnell moment? I didn't understand what you <laughs> said. I didn't. Oh. <laughs> I thought there was something going on in the background. Then I realized, oh, you're just quoting oh. the movie. <laughs> uh, Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers, 13. 13. 13. 13. Yes. What a horror movie, <laughs> especially with mm. you, with Bob, you you having a young daughter. What was that movie? Yeah, no Jesus shit. Christ. That's a horror movie. Uh huh. Saved. Something's got to give. Saved. I Saved. love that movie. Oh, the, when she throws the Bible at her and says, "I am filled with Christ's love." That's <laughs> that is every conservative Christian on Twitter. Goodbye, Lennon. Grease two. Goodbye, Lennon. I've never seen Goodbye, Lennon. Either Highly underrated. Oh, well, since you voted, you're the only one who saw both, so. We'll go with you. Transformers, Revenge of the Fallen, Taken 2. Taken 2. Taken 2. I don't care. Electric Boogaloo. There's really only a few reasons I would ever take Taken 2, and if it's up against Transformers, that's the reason. I get it. Batman <laughs> Forever, Seven Psychopaths. Batman Forever, Seven Psychopaths was disappointing. Yeah. Batman Forever, and I really, really, really want to see the uh, director's cut of that that's been going around. That's the director's cut of that? Yeah, apparently there's a director's cut. Kevin Smith has seen it, and a couple other people have... They did a podcast about it. So, Restore the Marlon Wayans cut. <laughs> Tinker, Taylor, Soldier, Spy, The Babe. Tinker, Taylor, Soldier, Spy. Yeah, I mean, it's really good, especially if you're trying to fall asleep. <laughs> But the babe. I've never, I've, I, I've never made it through half of Tink- Tinker Taylor Soldier Spy. But have Just, you made it through the babe? <laughs> I've never even tried to do that. So. Exactly. Uh, best in show, Paul Blart Mall Cop. <laughs> best in the show. Best in show. We like soup. <laughs> we talking about stuff. Twelve monkeys, paths of glory. Twelve monkeys. Twelve monkeys. Okay. A Scanner Darkly, The Parent Trap, 1961. Scanner Darkly. I'm going to pick The Parent Trap because it was the first. Yeah, just I'm going to pick that just because, although I like A Scanner Darkly. I got The Scanner Darkly. I just wanted to get a boat. Elysium, The Spirit of the Beehive. I've not seen Spirit of the Beehive. It looks so good. 
Elysium or Jerry Maguire? Jerry Maguire. Elysium. It doesn't have Tom Cruise in it. Jerry Maguire is awesome. Death Trap, Mr. Mom. Mr. Mom. I have not seen Death Trap. I own it. It's in a. Sh- it's on a shelf somewhere behind me, but I haven't watched it yet. It's free on YouTube so, as well. They keep marketing it. Yeah, I don't know. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I saw it years ago. I barely remember it. Whereas Mr. Mom at least has a little bit of nostalgia to it, even if it doesn't hold up. Mr. Mom was the first movie I saw twice in the theaters, but and one of them was almost by myself. <laughs> Snoopy Come Home, King Kong. I think that's a TV special. Yeah. Bolt, King Kong, 2005. King Kong. King Kong. I hate when Flick Shark gets boring. <laughs> <laughs> Being John Malkovich, Shadow of the Vampire, 2000. Oh, man. Two oh, fuck. Movies. Being John Malkovich is my pick, but I love, love Shadow of the Vampire. Which Shadow is of the Vampire is perfection. It's not available anywhere. You can't watch it anywhere. So you guys splitting? Yeah, I went with, yeah, I went with Being John Malkovich. I'll go and being, I went with Shadow of the Vampire. I'll go Being John Malkovich. Willem Dafoe is just like... Oof, that is awesome, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. I love you, man. The Haunting... Love you, man. 1999. Whatever. I'll go with I like The Haunting just enough to watch it, but... Uh, Mr. Nobody, Boana. I've not seen Boana. I've, I haven't seen either one of them. Reservoir Dogs, The Sandlot. Reservoir Dogs. Reservoir Dogs. Monty Python's The Meaning of Life, Silent Nights. I don't remember Silent Night. No, I've never seen that one. Not even that old. <laughs> the Meaning of Life, Law Abiding Citizens. Oh, Meaning of Life. Good God, <laughs> Law Abiding Citizens is bad. Ugh. Agreed. Eight Legged Freaks, La Bamba. La Bamba. That movie's incredible. La Bamba. Lou Diamond Phillips should have been a bigger star. Mm. Fight Club, Chicken Little. Power was a mistake. Fight Club. Fight Club. The Avengers with Sean Connery. Lizzie of the Field. Never heard of it. 24. The Avengers versus the Avengers. Uh, Avengers Gangster Squad, 2013. Gangster Squad. Whatever. I don't care about either one of them. bad, so... All right, I'm bored. You guys want to end it? <laughs> <laughs> this is really dull, yeah. <laughs> For all those hung, that hung around, Maze Runner you. Death Tour is like one of the worst movies. It's just so, so bad. It was actually the worst movie that of 2018. Nice. Sure Incredibles the is the best Fantastic Four movie to date. That is true. All right, we'll pick it and we'll call it a night. <laughs> all right, <laughs> see you guys next week. Yep. See ya.